The music of Fire Shut Up In My Bones with its composer Terence Blanchard on trumpet and baritone Will Liverman. What you saw just there, that is musical history. That's opera history. For the first time in 138 years, the Metropolitan Opera is producing a production by an African-American composer. This is why we're all here on today's episode. We're looking at the contributions of African Americans, of black people around the world to the form of opera. Let's meet our guests. Hello, Terence. Hello, Karen. Hello, Michael. So good to have you here on the stream. Uh, Terence, introduce yourself to our global audience. Well, my name is Terence Blanchard. I'm a jazz musician by trade from New Orleans, Louisiana. And now, apparently, I'm an opera composer. Apparently so. And we're so happy about that. <laughs> Hello, Karen. A diva, a real diva. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, my name is Karen Slack. I'm a soprano, and um, I, I originally originated the role of Billy in the original production of Fire Shut Up in My Bones in St. Louis. Ah, oh, so good to have you. And hello, Mel Mel Michael. Welcome to the stream. Please introduce yourself to our audience around the world. Hi, I'm Michael Mohammed. I am a director and an educator based in San Francisco, California. All right, unfiltered. First thoughts about Fire Shut Up In My Bones. What does it mean to you, Michael, Karen, Terrence? Michael, you start. I think the importance of it is representation. Representation on its deepest level of what happens when we actually get to see um, black stories, black bodies on stage and in one of the largest platforms possible for opera. Mm -hmm. And how does that welcome in a new set of people, how does that actually make space at the table for new stories and for stories that are contemporary and, and stories that mean something to the to the bodies that are in the seats and who's getting to um, experience uh -huh. what the story is? Karen. I knew that fire was an incredible piece of history when I read the libretto for the first time. Uh, I wept. And to and I already knew Terence's music by singing the opera Champion, which was Terence's first opera, and I knew it was going to be special. And to to see such a prolific story told by such an incredible musician, it welcomes what opera what we say we want opera to be in the 21st century. To have the full culture, as we say, for the culture on the stage of a place that is so white. I've been on that stage, <laughs> you know, I've been in that company, but to have it on the largest operatic platform in the world, to have our story so prolific by Terrence and Casey and uh, Charles is incredible for opera. I don't think that they even understand how great it, the moment is. Mm -hmm. Terrence, sum it up. Well, I, th I think for me, you know, what this means is we get a chance to see our culture. You know, um, I met Karen, and because of Karen, I had this conversation with the cast here. We talked about it uh, a while ago. Karen remembers this when we were in my home in New Orleans when we were doing Champion. We talked about how so many African-American opera singers grow up in a church or grow up singing rhythm and blues, or some of them even grow up singing jazz. But when they enter into the operatic world, they're told to throw all of that and put it aside. And what I've wanted people to do in this production is to bring all of that back to, to this format, mm -hmm. you know, and allow them, give them space to, to experience and express themselves. You know, Angel Blue, she took it very seriously. Well, everybody has, but mm -hmm. Angel was the first to approach me. And uh, she said, you know, do you mind if I take some liberties? And I'm yeah. like, please. And Angel's one of your, your cast. She's, she's one of the characters in, in, in this production of Fire Shut Up In My Bones, right? Yeah, she's yeah. one of the principals. She plays three characters. She plays yeah. Loneliness, Destiny, and uh, Greta, the Beautiful. woman that Charles dates. Mm -hmm. But she sings this aria, Peculiar Grace, which is about Charles. And you can hear her bringing in her background as uh, um, a spiritually based performer, you know, you yeah. can hear it. And then she marries that with her training as an opera singer. And for me, it creates something very unique, but distinctly our own, you know. And the other thing about it, too, is that because we have an all black cast, which was something we didn't set out to do, it just wound up happening to be that way, is that 
the world gets a chance to see this level of talent that has existed in our community. Because, you know, I did one interview and a journalist asked me, he said, man, do you think your opera is going to inspire people to sing opera in the black community? I'm like, dude, they've been here for a long time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know? All right. So Terrence and Karen and Michael, I am going to share you with our international audience. If you're watching right now, you're on YouTube, jump into the comments section. Our conversation today is black artists flipping the libretto. See what I did there? In opera. <laughs> Comment section is here. Please join our discussion. You see, the essence of opera is storytelling. And pretty much up to this point, the operas that have been performed were primarily composed by one demographic, which ignores the narratives and stories of people, for example, who look like me. We also have stories to tell, stories that are romantic, tragic, funny, sad, joyful. Stories that need to be told on the concert stage through this beautiful medium of opera. The production of Fire Shut Up and My Bones says, our stories can't and shouldn't be ignored anymore because we have lots to say. Billy, I have to ask you, uh, Billy, <laughs> Karen, I have to ask you, when you were playing Billy, which is the mum in Fire Shell Up In My Bones, did, the, did it feel different from other productions that you were in? You, you're an experienced soprano. You, you've worked the world over. Did it feel different? Absolutely. First of all, Terrence knew my voice very well because I had sung uh, his first opera, so he crafted the piece for my in instrument particularly. But to, I didn't have to get into the skin. Mm -hmm. I I was playing my aunts. I mean, my my mom, my my cousins, women that I saw in my church. And the you know, it, it there's something about getting into Tosca, trying to, to turn yourself into an you know an 18th century Italian operatic soprano. You know what I mean? That's yeah. one thing. But yeah. to, to sing something like Billy. To, to live her. And I, I know who I represented on that stage. It was important for women who look like me to, to see themselves when I walked out, but even before I opened my mouth. That comment, Michael, came from earlier from Sean E. Ocabolo. He's a composer and a conductor, and he talked about there being relatable stories. Is this a time now where opera is realizing that you have to encompass the diversity of the community? You can't just be Eurocentric. I think from last summer with the reckoning, as I keep calling it, from the reckoning of last summer, us realizing that our institutions have to reflect the, the, the bodies, the people who, um, who, who are around it. I think, um, and I think because as, as opera is an institution that is old and it, it's slow to change. Yeah. So I think that we as the current living people trying to live and work and create in this medium. I think that we're, we're seeing that more and more it's got to open up and we've got to um, be hospitable to people who want to explore this as, as a storytelling medium, because I think, yeah. as he said in the video, that, that it's, well, it's theater, it's storytelling, it's narrative. Well, one of the things I wanted to add to what Michael was talking about is that, you know, what's the definition of insanity? doing the same thing and expecting a different result, right? So that's what the arts world has been doing when it's trying to sell this art form. And people have gotten to the point, you know, where we start to realize, no, that has to change. And I think when George Floyd was was murdered on, on television and that video was sent around the world, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to what we have been complaining about in this country for generations. And people have sought to make a difference. And I give Peter Gelb all the credit for, for saying that we need to not only do stories that are relatable to our generation, but we need to do stories like this to let people know that there are other voices out there that need to be heard. And here's the thing that's most important. It's a universal story. It's not a story that's just unique to the African-American community, but it's a story that's told through our lens. And by it being told through our lens, you know, there are so many people who can come and relate. One journalist said this is the most diverse audience he's seen at the Met in his 20-some years of covering the Met. 
So I want to tell people who don't know the story, Fire Shut Up In My Bones. It is based on the memoir of Charles Blow, who was a really well-known New York Times columnist and a writer. Mm -hmm. It is an extraordinary story, but it's also a story about an African-American man. And you're hearing Karen and Michael and Terence talking about stories being relatable and stories from our community. What would that look like, for instance, in rehearsal or practice session? I love this video. This is a movement exercise for fire shut up in my bones. Have a look. I challenge you not to dance. smiling so many people around the world are now gonna go see opera that's what opera is about I, I'm gonna bring in another voice the voice though this is Juliana Pistorius who who really gets to the matter of why it has been challenging for African Americans for people of color to be involved in opera here she is I think the thing with black composers contributions to opera it's not necessarily that they are treated better or worse, but that they are always treated as somehow different. This is not just opera, but black opera or indigenous opera or folk opera or any of the other names that are used to describe these contributions. So black composers work always comes with a qualifier, which implies that it somehow falls outside the norm or that it's not normal. And because of this, I don't think it is treated on an equal footing, no. Karen, you're looking thoughtful. Your thoughts first and then Michael's. My, me? Yeah, Karen, you start. Well, well, I also think it is a lack of education with the administrators and a, a lack of courage with those who get to make decisions. You know, people, we hear a lot about gatekeeping because of the time that we were in with the racial, racial reckoning. But it is the administrators, the general directors, the intendants who get to dictate what culture is for the community that come to the that come to the opera. And we can change that. This is not 1935. Mm. It's 2021. And I think every arts organization has a responsibility to their community to show them the breadth of what's available. Yeah, and I also think it even begins even beyond that with um, the pipeline in and who it, it's it's a reaching forward and a reaching back. And we're reaching forward, we're moving the thing forward, but we're also reaching back to bring people along with us. And I think that's um, part of the gatekeeping and how do we break open the gates? How do we disrupt the, any of the, the systems that have, that have kept what the ideas of normal and not normal and who gets to be part of the conversation and who doesn't. I think the more we can disrupt and break those doors open and bring people along, and I think that's the part. Um, and the, the, the anti sort of colonial mindset of opera and that we're really trying to, to, to widen a conversation, democratize the space so that most more people get um, a chance to, to be in the space and to talk about it and to have these stories be told. I have questions for you from YouTube. I'm going to fire them at you. Come back with instant answers so we can get in as many as possible. Uh, Terence, I'm going to give this one to you. This is Donovan. Um, he wanted to know about the Met Opera and, quoting Dor Dor Donovan here, it's racist history. Making a black opera is big, but it's a hella sad that it took this long to do this. 138 years. That's me adding that on. <laughs> the rest was Donovan. Terence, instant answer. <laughs> 
Well, well, here's the thing, you know, about this. You know, while I'm very proud of our heritage, I'm very proud of everybody that's in this production, we made opera. You know, we're not trying to be separatists. You know, I, I, and I think this is really important. Karen is my sister, and we know we've had a lot of conversations, and one of the things that we have never talked about is her being a black soprano. We talked about her being an amazing soprano. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that she's African-American. Just so happens yeah, that yeah, this story yeah. is told through the lens of the African-American community. But, you know, there are other communities, there are Asian communities, the, all peoples of walk, different walks of life who have stories to tell. And I think that's where I think we start to fall short. You know, one guy asked me, did, did I think that white people were going to come and listen to this opera. And, I'm, and I told them, I said, your question implies that we shouldn't go see opera that's done by Verdi or Puccini. You know, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we are trying to be the most accomplished artists that we can be. Mm -hmm. We're trying to bring all of our communities, our background, our upbringing, our experiences to the stage. And if we're really trying to be artists, not business people or politicians, if we're trying to be artists, then everybody should be welcome. Everybody should have a forum to tell stories. I'm going to get back to YouTube in a moment because there's some really good questions on YouTube for you guests. But first, we take a pause to bring in the gorgeous voice of Karen Slack. She's singing here in Minnesota Opera's production of Dead Man Walking based on the book of the same name. Here's Miss Slack. To, I keep wanting to call you Kiki because I've been watching your Kiki <laughs> conversations and you are having, have a look here on my laptop, uh, Karen knows this, she's been having during, during lockdown, during the pandemic, she's, she has been bringing the opera community together. Here she is, this is my favourite one, with soprano Angela Brown and there was a moment where Angela told a story and you were really good because you let her tell the story about how she didn't get a role because the dress wasn't big the right size for her, but then she went to see the production and the woman playing the part, who won the part, was exactly the same size of Angela Brown. So there's this sense of unfairness in the opera world, or at what point does the fact that this impact your ability to play and sing a fictional character oftentimes? Oh my goodness, it does act that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a little question, a question there for you, yeah. Exactly. That was the conversation before Black, before color yeah. was about size. Yeah. You know, De Deborah Voigt is one of the most um, prolific dramatic sopranos of our time, and she had had this gigantic career, and because she couldn't fit a dress at Covent Garden, that they wanted to have a smaller woman, she she mm. was fired. Ooh. And so, you know, the common denominator, or that we don't get roles, in, unless I, I guess say they are the, the Leontine Price roles, ideally, if you are... Um, not just singing the Verdi and the Puccini, as if, you know, Black people can't sing German music or French music, you know. I mean, it does matter in this, in this, but again, it goes back to the people who gets who get to decide who gets to have a career who doesn't, what roles, what operas get shown and produced. We have to change the people who make this decision. We have to make that more inclusive, yeah. you know, because again, we want people to come to the theater to see themselves in every every opera, every role we present, you know, not just thin people make love, not just thin people fall in love, not just white people, you know, have happily ever after. We need yeah. to, or, you know, poison to death, whatever that is, you know, in opera, but... You know, y'all shocked me with that dead man walking. I was ah, yeah, It was beautiful. <laughs> on, on YouTube, we're, 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 uh, this is a really nitty gritty question. Michael, I'm going to give this one to you. What do you do in opera if you want to be more diverse, but the funding comes from white donors? Ooh, that's the rich question. It really is a <laughs> literally a rich question. <laughs> because, um, you know, and, and funding in the United States is so not tied to 
um, the government. It's not. It's it's untethered to any sort of of real um, system of, of of support. So it does rely on donors. So there's always this this balancing act between what do you expect the donors to want to support and what wow. do you expect audiences because audiences rely you know companies rely on on, on ticket sales so it's it's this delicate dance that companies have to do um yeah. and i I'm, and i'm sorry i'm sorry go ahead go ahead well no i think i think there's a there's a misconception about that too you know it's just like anything else because what I was very, very proud of with the production of Fire Shut Up In My Bones with was that Darren Walker, who's an African-American who runs the Ford Foundation, was a big supporter of this production. Sheila Johnson, who's also African-American and loves classical music, was also a big supporter of this production. So we made history in that regard as well. And I think, you know, we, we have people in our community who have money, you know, who have been raising dollars and they need to understand that they can have a say so in what goes on the stage at these performance theaters you know and i think darren walker and sheila johnson have set a precedent by doing so at the met uh, terence i want to pick up on on a point that you made earlier about the universality of opera and and stories that they can be for all people all around the world so for this last comment i'm going to cape town to an opera student who is a soprano and she talks about the universality of opera. It's not just for white people. Here she is. Mm -hmm. Opera itself is, 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 is a European art form, but the stories that have been told in these operas, they're quite universal, which is why we find different ad adaptations of these stories done uh, all over the world, uh, relating to the cultural experiences of those areas. For instance, there was once a production of La Boheme that was done here. And uh, in this production, Mimi at the end died because of uh, HIV and AIDS linked to TB. And you do also get other um, opera companies who go even further to even alter the orchestration where it's not your normal uh, orchestra that you'll get in those big uh, opera houses. Mm -hmm. So. Terence, so I'm, I'm just looking yeah. at a picture here on my laptop, and I, I love this picture so much. I'm just going to do this down here. Never saw mm. this coming. <laughs> what the what? I love it so much. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden in London, and I used to play spot the other black person if there was another black person. I'd be like <laughs> yes, looking, right. we'd have our opera glasses on, and we'd be looking, and I was like, I found one! There's another black person <laughs> over there! Um, and I love what all three of you are doing and the community of black performers are doing because I think that game of spot the other black person is going to be less rewarding now. That There are going to be so many that it will no longer be a game. Terence, closing thoughts. Go ahead. Well, I think it's a shame when I listen to that young lady talk to think that in order to have a black cast, we need to do a retake on Puccini. And I love Puccini. I love Lava Women. It's one of my favorite operas. But I'm so proud of the fact that we're doing stuff that can relate to people's lives today. And hopefully that will open the door for that young lady and other people just like her to tell their stories the way they see fit. Because I know with what the, the level of success we've had with Fire Shut Up In My Bones at the Met, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's been a reckoning for people to understand that they are people who will come to opera if they will see themselves on the stage. Oh my goodness. This is a perfect segue into the closing video I'm going to show you. It's the famous step dance from Fire Shut Up In My Bones. Michael, Karen, Terence, thank you so much. I will leave you with Fire Shut Up In My Bones, the step dance. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs>